Welcome to Grandma's Room Podcast, episode 101. We're over the, the, the hump. 101. When the frogman jumped out of the ocean, all the flies scattered. What? And the moon lit up the land. The hell are you talking about? And only the frog could see. Today, we're talking about the third man factor and the butcher of Warsaw. So... Any, any thoughts before we start this, this honky? Um, I, I'm, I'm just kind of lost as to like what that little monologue was, but I'm not going to ask questions. It was a haiku <laughs> that I wrote in my head. It, yeah. But it didn't have the same rhythm as a haiku should. Yeah, like five, seven, five. Yeah, but I, I say it's a haiku, so it's a haiku. Well, you're just riffing. Art's subjective. Yeah. I mean, you're just riffing. Just you riffing. can't stop it. Like, I'm just riffing. 101 Dalmatians, 101 palpitations of the heart. 101 ejaculations. <laughs> I like that one more than Me too. palpitations. 101 ejaculations. A Benjamin Thomas story. <laughs> this chair is going to continue to be loud as fuck. Hi, loud as fuck. I'm dad. And I tried taking the arms off this chair before. Yeah. Because they're, they're the parts that creak. And... And then the whole back falls off. The back is held on by the arms. Mm. So I could have a stool. I'm going to put my feet on the stool. So you want to get into it? Yeah, I want to hear about this third man factor. Do you have any idea what it is? I have no clue. I'm going to have to, I'm going to guess it has something to do with like conspiracy theory. Nope. Okay. I mean, I guess you could. It's more paranormal. Okay. So we've all heard of guardian angels. They seem to come in our time of need. Come in our time of need. But have you heard of the third man factor? Do they bring pearl necklaces? I guess they could. Depends if the third man is a horn dog. Yeah. So, in many stories of survival and extreme circumstances, a person who is about to face death or serious injury will find the help of someone who couldn't possibly be be by their side. Be it a phantom hand hoisting a person out of their out of water not to be seen once they regain their senses or somebody blocking the edge of a cliff when you're about to fall off only to disappear into thin air third man factor is as mysterious as it is interesting a lot of the time when a third man factor is experienced it's experienced by an explorer who is starving about to freeze to death is close to drowning or anything like that anything where you're like about to die um mainly when you're on the verge of death so Ernest Shackleton, you know who he is, right? The Arctic explorer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he described experiencing this while trying to find safety. I'll get into that later. And Aaron uh, Windauer of Adventure Journal wrote, The visions that appeared to people were both men and women, and sometimes even a particular person, like a dead spouse, parent, or friend. These visions often spoke to person in distress, providing comfort, advice, or simply company. And in most cases, the presence disappeared again just before help arrived. So, like, say you're in water, you're about to drown. There's a story of a lady who fell in between, like, I don't know what exactly it was, but, like, she couldn't climb up the, it was, like, a steep bank. She couldn't get out of the water. And she said a hand took her and just, like, like hoisted her out of the water, put mm. her on, and then, like, when she looked around, there was nobody there. There's also stories of cave divers. They, like, dive in, like, yeah. these crazy caves. And their, like, oxygen tank is running out and they don't know where to go, and a person just shows up and, like, like beckons to them and, like, leads them out of the water, like, right before they're about to die, and then they disappear, like, they have no idea where they went. So, seeing people who have passed away, but, but like, people who you know, like, say, say, like, you have a grandma, and she, like, leads you to safety, um, this leads some people to believe that this third man factor is, like, gar- your guardian angel, like, somebody that you know. Why third, though? It's just a name they gave it because, like, I think it originated from a story where there's two people who are about to die in the wilderness and the third guy showed up. Okay. That's just the name of it. So, there's also an anesthesiologist in 1981 that suggested that freezing cold in cases of people who are, like, suffer- like suffering hypothermia could cause neurochemical changes in the brain that could make you see hallucinations, and that's all it is. Um... 
that these haven't only been seeing in like the freezing cold people who have been trying to survive in the jungle have also experienced third man which you could say it could be like heat stroke yeah um so there's also the story of charles Lindbergh. you know who he is the first transatlantic flight yeah he also experienced this in his plane he was like fought, fighting fog storms like ice was building up inside his cockpit and everything and exhaustion we'll also get into that i have that story later other researchers thought that maybe low blood sugar and starving explorers could cause them to see visions like you're about to die from starvation you're just like delirious but what about ron DeFrancesco, who was guided out of fire and smoke on 9 11 by a, a stranger also get into that he wasn't starving mm -hmm. he wasn't he was it was just high stress he was in, he was inhaling smoke <clears throat> which could he was about to like suffocate so yeah i don't know i actually got into the stress like all, all these people have in common it seems to be that stress mm -hmm. so i don't know if that could cause you to see something but the stories get weird especially the story on 9-11 i'll get into that like after the first two stories i have um so i don't know if it's the stress or like the primal urge to like survive that just causes something in your brain to like snap I don't know if it, yeah like i don't know if it's like snapping or like firing on all cylinders like mm -hmm. maybe tapping into something we don't know we have or is it something more supernatural like like a good ghost like casper so, like casper the ghost leading you out of a a dungeon of cum you're about to drown, drown in cum and he come he rises out of the cum yeah because he is white mm -hmm. that's probably what casper is dude just like floating a floating cum it's a guy under a sheet He's got trapped in a vat of cum. <laughs> well, I don't know. It could be. You tell me what he is. How old is Casper the Friendly Ghost? At least 69 years old. And I don't know. Hang on. Casper? Casper the Scroat. Um. Oh. First appearance was in 1939. At least 69. Okay. So I'll get into some of these stories about um, the third man factor. So in on December 5th, 1914, Ernest Shackleton and his group of, he has a crew of 27 men, 69 dogs. Hell yeah. Wait, who? Ernest Shackleton. Oh. On his ship, he had 27 guys, 69 dogs. I'm guessing for like sleds. Yeah. And they had a cat named Mrs. Chippy. Nice. They set out for, for Antarctica on the ship called the Endurance. So, on January 18th, 1915, the ship got lodged in ice and wasn't able to move at all. So, they are like, we're just going to have to, like, float until the ice breaks up. Mm -hmm. So, the ice eventually started to destroy the ship, so they had to abandon it, and it eventually sunk. Like, Did you see they found that a few months ago? Yeah. Yeah, it was recent, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, like, like super well-preserved because the water's so cold. It'd be cool to see. Yeah. To find. So, yeah, they had to abandon the ship. They didn't see... Um, the Clarence and Elephant Islands until April 7th. So they were on the ice for months. Yeah. So the ice broke up. So they had to get on lifeboats. And after six rough days in the freezing ocean, like the ocean was not calm at all. So they were like getting sprayed with like freezing cold water and like constantly having to bail out their boats and Antarctic cold. I don't know how cold it was, but absolutely below zero. Pretty. Pretty cold. So after six rough days in the freezing ocean, the islands were now closer, 30 miles away. And one of Shackleton's crew said at least half of the party was insane. So they like just driven to insanity by how crazy everything was. Mm -hmm. So on April 15th, they finally landed on Elephant Island. So they got to land, but they were not much closer to any safety or rescue. Because they tanked Antarctica yeah. in the early 1900s. Pretty much nobody's there. Uh, they waited for nine days to gather their wits and like heal up, I guess. Like, they set up camp. Uh, so, after the nine days, Shackleton and four others set out in, in lifeboats to find a whaling station over 800 miles away. They were in the water for 16 more days, where they were constantly bailed out water, and they had to, like, de-ice their sails constantly, because, obviously, cold, freezing water is going to... Yeah. And it's going to build up. It's getting splashed on. Ice is fucking heavy. Yeah. Especially, like, when it's building up on the sails. <clears throat> so... One of the boats got blown off course, so now it was just Shackleton, Worsley, and Tom Crean. 
and they landed and walked another 36 hours to get to the Stromness whaling station. And on that last stretch, that 36 mile hike that they took, uh, there were only th three of them. Like I said, Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean. But Shackleton felt the whole way that there's a fourth person with him. Like he, like I don't know if he saw him or just like felt the presence. Yeah. Like some people explain it by they just felt a presence with him the whole time. So he said, during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that there were that we were four, not three. So apparently, after Shackleton came forward with this, other explorers started coming forward with similar stories during like their extreme survival. So. In recent years, explorers like um, Reinhold Messner and Peters Hillary claimed that they experienced similar things. Most commonly, this is reported by climbers. Second, second most often, it's um, by like solo sailors and shipwreck survivors, and third by polar explorers like Shackleton. Mm -hmm. So it's not an uncommon scenario. Like he was, they, it's pretty often that when you're about to die. It seems like something supernatural helps you. So we'll get into Charles Lindbergh. He was the guy that did the transatlantic flight. So on May 20th, 1927, Charles Lindbergh took off from New York to try and make the first transatlantic flight. 34 hours later, he landed in Paris. He had done it, but he wasn't exactly, it wasn't exactly a picture perfect flight. He had to fly through storms, crazy fog, ice forming in the fuselage, like in, inside his plane, yeah. there was ice forming. And it's said that he even fell asleep with his eyes open during his flight. But I don't know. They Some people attribute that to him seeing a person with him. But, like, they didn't have autopilot back then. Yeah. So I don't know if he would have fallen asleep. Like, he, I feel like if he fell asleep, even with his eyes open, he would have crashed. Well, know. as long as he doesn't move or he doesn't just go... But don't you constantly it? have to kind of keep the plane nose up? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know the first thing about flying. I don't know either. I figured, though, that, that like if you didn't pay attention, it would just kind of dive because of gravity keeping it. Like, yeah, but if you're up high enough, that probably wouldn't be a problem. I don't know. I don't know. But apparently he there's rumors that he fell asleep with his eyes open during his flight. So staying in the air was a matter of life and death at this point because he drove the ocean. Yeah. Um, there's not radar and stuff like there is today. They wouldn't be able to find, like see where you're at at all times. Mm -hmm. So... He was about halfway through his flight and he started seeing people in his plane. He said, These phantoms speak with human voices. They are friendly, vapor-like shapes without substance, able to appear or disappear at will, to pass in and out through the walls of the fuselage. So, like, they would just, like, come in through the side of his plane. He also said, um, They were discussing problems of my navigation, reassuring me, giving me messages of importance unattainable in ordinary life. These spirits have no rigid bodies, Yet they remain human in outline and form. They're neither intruders nor strangers. It's more like a gathering of friends and family after. After years of separation, as though I'd known all, all of them before in some past life. So, like, he didn't know them, but he knew them. Mm -hmm. And they were, like, just reassuring him, like, being like, you're, you're going to be all right. I guess trying to keep him awake or something. Yeah. And like I said, I don't know if that's his brain doing that or if it's actually something. So then, I'm blowing through these notes way faster than I thought I would. It's my last page. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Damn. So the last story I have is Ron DeFrancesco. Ron DeFrancesco was on the 84th floor of the South Tower when the second plane hit on 9-11. He was fucking high up. Yeah. So. Well, because that hit in like the 70s or 60s, didn't it? I think he said the plane came in at an angle, so the wing destroyed up higher and below. Oh, okay. So, um. Yeah, he started running down, like, the stairs, trying to escape all the smoke and the flames and everything. Obviously, shit's falling everywhere, and, like, it's just pure survival. So, he was going down the stairs, and he had to lay down, because there was so much smoke and fire, and if he stayed standing, he would have suffocated. So, he was on the verge of death when somebody took his hand and started leading him through the disaster. Uh, the person led him through as if they had, like, a perfect map of everything that was destroyed. Like, he just knew where to go. Like, he wasn't, like, going to, like, a dead end and being, like, turned around and everything. So, Ron said that he was choking and started to suffocate. This is back when he was in the stairs. Uh, he said he was choking and starting to suffocate. He was starting to hallucinate when a man appeared. This is kind of why I think it might be just hallucinations. 
He said the man was tall and confident and the fire didn't even seem to touch his clothing. He thought that this was it and he was like hallucinating a dude just standing there above him. Shit, that was loud. Yeah. So we about that. But um yeah, he said he thought he was hallucinating until the dude actually took his hand and like started leading him through everything. So the man led him down to the bottom floor and he was the last man out before the tower fell. He was like the last one that res- that uh, rescuers saw. No, they didn't see the dude that led him through though. And so he doesn't think it was quite paranormal. He said it was more like a real man, but he also said it was a higher being rather than an internal being. Maybe it was an angel. I didn't see the face of God, but I know somebody came and helped me. So it's just another uh, example of someone just like in front of you leading you. Yeah. But then rescuers didn't see the dude that led him out. They just saw him run out of the smoke and everything. And then he was the last person out before the tower fell. Yeah, it's pretty insane. I can't imagine how much that would fucking haunt you for the rest of your life. Mm-mm. He said he has, like, a sort of survivor's guilt. Which I can't really even get into. Yeah. I, 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 I can say, like, there's no reason to feel that, but then... You weren't I there. Go, yeah, I didn't go through the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so I tried to find, like... When it comes to stories like this, I, I try, I'd like to go to Reddit and just see if other people at least claim to experience this stuff. Mm-hmm. There are two bits. Yeah, because with most of this stuff, like the paranormal stuff, you can never prove any of it. Yeah. But I like to get stories of, like, possible interactions with stuff, but I couldn't find anything. The only ones I could find was Ernest Shackleton and um, DeFrancesco. Like, there was no posts mm-hmm. about other people. So, yeah. Well, that's what I have for the third man factor. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. I like that. I just I don't know what to think of it, because like, in all of these scenarios, when you're close to death, you would think hallucination would be like part of like your last. Yeah. Like when your body's just like not functioning right, but then what about him actually, getting grabbed by the hand? Yeah. He he wouldn't have known. Every single way to get through the wreckage, and this dude just led him right through it, mm-hmm. like nothing, like he knew it. So I don't know. I mean. I don't have to say. Yeah. Maybe he had a lot of eagle vision. Yeah. Like, is that red dead? Mm-hmm. They call it eagle vision? Yeah. Eagle eye? Golden eye? Brown eagle, eye? Eagle eye. Brown eye. Stink eye. Stink eye. Rusty sheriff badge. So let me hear about the Butcher of Warsaw. I'm interested. You piqued my interest. Yeah, so this guy, uh, he was a big piece of shit, too. <laughs> um, I'm just going to start off with that. Mm. So... What do you mean two? As compared to the guys in last week's episode. Uh, um, so Oscar, I think it's a Dil Dil or Dil no. Dil Wonka or Dil Wonka or something like that. Um, I'm, it's like D I R L E W A N G E R. Um, this video I I've never heard of this channel before. Uh, it's called Disturbian History. I followed him as soon as I was done watching the video. I liked it a lot. Um, but, so, he was a member of the SS, and, like, he was so hated that, like, even the Germans, like, they're like, why is this guy here? Get him the fuck out of here. I think I've heard of this guy. Yeah, he's, like, nuts. Um, there's, like, not a, not a lot known about, like, the early part of his life. But uh, even though he was disliked, he had lots of connections with high-ranking Nazi officials because of his service in World War One. He served with some guys, and they helped him get out of trouble a few times. And because he was a piece of shit then too. Well, I, I'll get I'll get in. No, not in World War One. Um, I mean, he could have been. I don't know. But so he served in World War One, and for his service, he had earned some medals. But when the end of the war came along. They were about to be taken for prisoner, him and the 600 men, like, under his command. So they walked from Romania to Germany, and they escaped, like, being taken prisoner. And after the war, he was concerned with, like, the new Soviet government and, like, the spread of communism. And he joined this group of people, and it was, like, all, like, veterans from, like, the the Great War. And they would, like, go around and, like, use violence to, like, stop the spread of communism and, like, left-leaning 
ideas and stuff like that. And so he was like, they, they're kind of like the mafia almost. It's said that politicians use them to like get rid of like other people and like, uh, like intimidate them to like, don't run stuff like that. Um, and it said that like, he was so violent with it. One time he took an armored train into this town that like, it was like communist ruled or whatever. Like the people in charge were like communists and he like wiped out the town with his armored train. Oh shit. Yeah. Um, I thought that was actually kind of cool. Not that that happened, but like that story. Like the, the armored train. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty neato. Um, so this was like two years after the World War One ended. So four years later, after the war ended, um, he got his doctorate and he also joined the Socialist Party, which if you don't know, those are the Nazis. And so he like after he joined, he started to get into trouble. Because he had uh, multiple, like, um, he was arrested multiple times for having illegal weapons and just, like, little things like that. But his real trouble didn't come till about 14 years after the Great War ended. Or, I'm sorry, 16 years. It was 1934. Um, so, by this point, the Nazis, they're swinging in Germany. They got that bitch locked down. And... He got in trouble for having sex with a 14-year-old girl. Oof. Yeah. So, like, even they were like, oh, you're a piece of shit. And they, like, they, like, caught him from the party. And he lost his doctorate. And, like, it was looking pretty bleak for him. And then he he had a friend who was, like, in charge of, like, the SS or, like, a high-ranking guy. His name was Berger. And he was he went to him. He was like, like can you, like, do anything for me? And so he got him a position where he was in charge of these guys as an unofficial part of the SS. And, like, it was pretty nuts. He would use, like, first-degree, like, murder convicts and arsonists and, like, these, like, horrible people. Like, he'd, like, pick them up from jail. And he'd use these guys to go, like, ravage Europe. Um, So when, like, World War II broke out, um, they went and it said that they were used along the Eastern front. So like Russia and like all that, all those countries over there. And he encouraged them to do like all the bad things that like you shouldn't do. Like what they were in prison for. Yeah. And he was like, just do whatever you want. And he like encouraged all of it. And, um, like there was like no like moral, like compass to any of these people or uh, this guy. Pretty much the Nazis. Yeah, but like, I would beg to differ that this is even worse. So, I'll get into some of the stories. Um, it said that looting was a big thing. Like, he strongly encouraged looting because they would go and just like wipe out these towns and like Poland and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, his, his job was to like get rid of like... Um, Oh, what's it called? I know I have it in here somewhere. Uh, someone who resistance fighters. Oh, okay. Um, so his job was like to take out like resistance fighters, and so the way he saw to do that was just to kill everybody: kids, old people, men, women, children, babies. So like, everybody is wiped out in these towns, and so they'd roll up. They'd kill all the guys, and uh, it said sometimes they would take women and, like, girls and, like, strip them down, like, nothing, wearing nothing. Uh, they'd be, like, abused, like, sexually assaulted, and then they'd give him poison for fun just to watch him, like, like writhe in agony and die. Um, they'd be, like, hung in, like, town squares and stuff like that, and they'd be, like, stabbed to death with bayonets. Um were like beaten with like the ends of their like the butts of their rifles like till like their skull was crushed yeah these guys were fucking ruthless um and like even i think it's daryl wonker or something like that i'm i'm just gonna say d big d so big d he would uh he was like not afraid to kill his own soldiers to have his way it said that if someone took something that he wanted to loot 
he'd kill him on the spot. Not even ask him for it? No. Huh. Um, and so he wasn't, and he wasn't afraid to do this to guys who, like, wouldn't obey orders. So he'd be like, slaughter this whole family. And they'd be like, no. And it'd just be right there. He'd be shot. I think I'd rather die. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would too. Um, so after like the first like bout of this, he was taken to court because like they were like, dude, like you're taking this step a little too far. Like, we get some war crimes here and there, but come on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Berger, he like interfered and he had Himmler come in and say something. And he's like, well, it's best to have too few killed than too many Poles uh, killed. The The point he was trying to make was that it's good to have more killed than to have fewer and have something happen. Better to have more than not enough. Yeah. Um, That's what they say at work all the time. Um, what about killing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And so he gets released and he's like, all back to normal and he got an, an a uh, promotion after this so he gets more men and he the his like detachment or whatever uh they were used to clean up like where the nazis had been on the eastern front to make sure that there weren't any resistance resistance fighters in warsaw and this is like where he gets his name um warsaw was a ghetto right i don't know i think it was a ghetto in poland yeah i think you're right um it, it said that um, he did, like, a bunch of fucked up shit over there. Uh, one of his soldiers, after the war, he, like, wrote in, like, a diary or something. He, like, about, like, all the stuff he saw. Um, when he first arrived, he was shocked by how bad the conditions were that these guys were living in. Like, they are all drunk. They, like, some of them didn't have clothes like and, like... Soldiers? Yeah. Okay. They didn't have, like, clothes and weapons. So they'd take whatever they did, like, they could off, like, their dead friends... Because his idea, Big D's big idea of, like, them fighting is just send them in until, like, we take them. And it doesn't matter how many guys get killed. So he would have, like, super high casualties. They are just expendable, too. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so he showed up and, like, they all, like, st- like, they smelled, like, death. You know, like, horrible. And so there was one account that he had where he said that uh big d himself he put this lady and her baby on top of the the tank he was riding to use this was uh, this was common he used like these like innocent people as human shields because people wouldn't want to shoot them huh because people wouldn't want to shoot them like to not get shot at all or just no just so you didn't get shot he just put these people in front of him and the baby fell off and the tank ran it over like with like the treads and this lady like like for like a good reason started like freaking out and like lost her shit and uh he finally killed her just to get her to shut up like that's fucked um there's another story well stories where they would like soldiers would walk into hospitals and white cross buildings and they just go around and beat the guys like the wounded people with the ends of their rifles until their heads were their skulls were caved in like it's not even like they were resistance fighters like most of these people were just innocent like caught in the crossfire yeah um and so they'd beat the men and then like they'd take the nurses and like abuse them and uh then they'd hang them like public squares and like big d was like the one like executing them too like kicking the stool out from underneath them wow. like bricks and stuff like that um this one this is pretty messed up there was one time where he said he found a school and what well, he didn't know it was a school but this guy that was writing all these stories he his job was to blow up the doors of like these buildings and then these guys would go in and like you know deal with everyone and he blew up the doors and there was like 500 kids all just standing there with like their hands up and these guys came in and just started shooting all of them and then big d stepped in he was like don't waste your ammo and so they started stabbing them with their bayonets yeah yeah um so after this is just a few stories there's like a lot more than that but after cleaning out warsaw 
he was given control of 4,000 men and received many medals just for, like, sending his men to die with so much as an afterthought. How many men did he have before? Um. Like, was this, like, an upgrade? Yeah, this is an upgrade. I don't know, I don't know how many he had before this, but, um, yeah. So, he, oh, my bad. Uh, I put 1945. So, yeah, this was, like, almost at the end of the war. So, in 1945, he gets these men, and they get sent... I can't remember where at, but they got sent somewhere else. And he was known for, like, leading his men into battle. And he got shot or wounded or something. And so, they sent him home to Germany. And he saw what it was like there. And he's like, shit, we are not winning this. This is, like, the end of 1945. Like, like five or six months before, like, the war was over. At least in Germany. And so... Uh, yeah, he knew that they weren't going to win, so he ran away and, like, went into hiding. And uh, a few months later, this was 1945, he was caught by, like, French soldiers. And they actually used a prisoner in some German, like, concentration camp, and he identified him. And so they took him, like, into custody. And he got sent to some, like, camp or whatever, and there was Polish guards there that were guarding him and they killed him like for like obviously good yeah. reason um Maybe, like knew him from warsaw or something yeah um and it said I, I thought it was pretty fucked up it said that like he's like not like a forgotten person like hitler and himmler and like um Big dude. no he was like he was the one in charge of uh Girls? okay that's another one who was in charge of like the um, like the, uh, the fucking planes. Um, I know what he looks like. He's big and he's flamboyant anyway. Um, but like, he's like, this guy's still remembered a lot and like neo-Nazis and all these other like far right groups and like militias like love him and like they use like his like insignias. Like, I guess his like patch i don't know if it's a patch or whatever but their company logo was two like hand grenades like crossed and like you can still find that like hanging around on like t-shirts and stuff like that like the potato masher grenade like the handle i don't know Pro- probably yeah i was wondering how two of like these grenades would be crossed they had like the long ones with the stick that would that makes a lot more sense i was picturing those mm. but yeah big d a piece of shit. Yeah, a b a big uh, dick, <laughs> big d. But he had a small dick. That's probably why he was so angry. Yeah. Micro wiener, like like Hitler. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of that guy in charge of the Luftwaffe. That's it. Yeah, the Luftwaffe. I know. I've heard it. He was super flamboyant. Yeah, he had a fucking attic that was a whole model train layout. <laughs> like of Germany, or just like his own little. No, like toy trains. Yeah. And he had, like, all these cars and stuff like that. How do you spell it? Luftwaffe? L-U-F-T-W-A-F-F-E, I think. Um. Fuck, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. He was weird as fuck. Yeah. He had, like, these, like, super nice cars. Um. He never addressed the standards. Herman Goring. Yeah, Goring. Why was that so hard to remember? I don't know. Because there's even... He's in a song, Hitler... Has only got one ball. Oh, Goebbels yeah. has two, but very small. Uh, Himmler has something similar, but Goering has no balls at all. <laughs> Didn't like Germany notoriously hate pilots, like like enemy pilots. I don't know. I thought I heard that somewhere where they're like, if they captured a pilot, like if you were a pilot and got captured, you were fucked. Like even worse. I've never heard that. Normal. Because they hated pilots. I thought you were going to say that Big D, like, tried to, like, defect. No. When he ran away. And I immediately thought of Inglorious Bastards. <laughs> when, uh, what was that dude's name in that? He was the colonel. Hans. Lanz? Colonel Lanz? Lanz? I think it might be Lanz. Um. But, like, how he, like, defected. And he's like, I surrender myself to you. And then he carved him the swastika on his yeah. forehead. That's such a good movie. Mm-hmm. Hans Landa. Landa. 
Lando Carlisle. Who? Star Wars. Don't know. Yeah, I know. I'm not. I'm not an avid Star Wars watcher or enthusiast. Oh, oh I know. I was just telling listeners. I get shit for it all the time. Yeah. You thought the Mandalorian was cool. No, I didn't. You were watching it and asking questions and shit about it. Yeah, because I was. I wanted to know what was going on. At least if I was watching it. Believe me, I do the same thing to mom's shows all the time, and I don't like them. Sex in the City. Every single time she's watching, I come in. What's going on? Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Sarah Equestrian Parker. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you should tell that to mom. She'll love it. I doubt. I doubt that. <laughs> Fuck. That was a dark. What's up with you, dark stories, dude? I don't know. I don't know. What are you doing next week? I did have an idea. I just thought of it while we were doing this. Is it dark? I don't remember. I already forget what it was. But what I was, was like, it? oh shit, that might be interesting. Um, I don't know. And a Diet Coke? No, it was not and a Diet Coke. We were drawing some fucked up pictures last night. Like, just trying to, like, make, like, the most, like, eyebrow raising. You drew a couple weird ones. You drew a couple weird ones, too. I weren't dark. Uh, yeah, I guess they weren't. I guess the one that you drew was my idea. <laughs> it was the and the Diet Coke was Ronald McDonald hanging from the gallows. With Grimace and uh the Hamburglar and onlooking and uh Death is just standing ominously on the on the gallows next to the switch that's thrown. Scythe and everything. Yeah. It was very I don't think we should say the other one you drew. No, I'm not. I'm not. Chin up. Yeah, just keep your chins up, guys. Is that all for this one? I think so. It's kind of short. I I bet 40-ish minutes. Yeah, I was about to say 40, 35 minutes. Not as short as I thought. Like, probably like what, like three inches? Uh, that's that's actually pretty big. Okay. If we're going small, I bet it's like an inch. So what would this episode be? Probably two. No. Dude, two's huge. Oh, yeah, my bad. It's probably, it's probably like four inches. I'd say an inch for every ten minutes. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah that seems reasonable. 3.8 inches. Mm -hmm. I bet this is 38 minutes. I'm going to bet 42. I can't look until we stop recording. I know you can't. For real. I guess I'll get into our plugs. Our hair plugs. You can follow us on Instagram at Grandma's Room Podcast. Uh, Twitter at Room underscore Grandma. Uh, I've been posting more memes lately. I, I noticed that. Page. I'm not gonna stop. Can't stop me. Can't stop me. I'm having a good time. Probably shouldn't be singing that. Why? For when we go on YouTube. You can sing it. You just can't play the actual song. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you can listen to us, or you can watch us on YouTube and Rumble, Grandma's Room Podcast. You can listen to us on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, all the big boys. Find us. And, yeah, that's where you can find us. Um, okay, so our Spotify playlist, I got them down this time. We got Grandma's Blues Club, which has, like, a bunch of blues music that I like. I don't, I don't know if you're quite the blues enthusiast, Joffrey. I'll listen to it. Um, uh, we got Grandma's Saloon, which has, like, Old Country, Marty Robbins, Hank Williams? I don't know. Is he on there? I don't know. Well, he should be. Um, uh, Grandma's Trap House, which is, like, rap, stuff like that. Grandma's guitar case, which is alternative and like rock, like newer rock music. Mm -hmm. uh, Grandma's jukebox, which is like old fifties and sixties classics. Uh, Grandma's clam jams, which is like summer eighties vibe playlist. Uh, Grandma's opium den, that's just like kind of vibe and mellow out music. Grandma's Christmas tree, Christmas music, but that's not really, really in right now. And is that it? Mm -hmm. Nice. That's it. We should start a new one. Like? <clears throat> Memes? Meme music? Fake meme music? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Probably, probably won't do that. I haven't added to them in a little bit. Yeah, me neither. I have a bunch of music saved to add to it. Mm -hmm. It's on Spotify. Yeah. You can follow it. It doesn't help us. We just hope you like it. Yeah, something we do. Uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you.
Thanks, guys. We're finally over 100. Yeah, thanks for lending your ears. Any final thoughts? Not necessarily related to the podcast? Uh, just keep your chins up. Uh, stay strong going into the next week. Make it to Friday. Be some badass motherfuckers and wake up with confidence. Make sure you wear sunscreen. Yeah. You will get burned. Yeah. Uh, what, do, what do you think, Joffrey? Drink water. Drink some water. Don't drink piss. I've seen a bunch of videos about people saying the benefits of drinking your own urine, especially aged urine. Like, like fine it, wine. Like it makes your skin healthier. Bullshit. And to me, it just seems like a bunch of disturbed people drinking their own piss. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to find some of those videos and put it on our Instagram so that you guys can see what, what I'm talking about. Should I start pl- posting some of the cringy shit? No, please, for the love of God. He, okay. I've been asking him for like three weeks now to stop sending me these cringy videos. I think it's been more like three months. Well, uh, whatever. Um, but he sends me like 10 of these videos that like makes me just want to curl up and die every day. And they're just super like off-putting and disturbing like and cringy. A lady with a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos going, nothing like a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos. That's not even the worst of it. Nothing like it. That's like pretty tame. What do you think is the worst one you saw? Um, I showed you the guy that was running like a wolf. There's, I mean, there's more than I can count that you've sent to me. There's peanut butter Fridays. And you, that one was kind of funny, but like you've said you'd stop and you haven't. I stopped for like a week. No, you stopped for a day or two. They're too good. I don't know why you don't like them. Because they're stupid. Yeah. And what do I always say, Ben? That's the point. That's not okay. They're just... They're so hard to watch. Some of them actually, like, make me, like, I have a visceral reaction to them. Like, like I was, I usually send them when I'm on the toilet. Because, like, that's when I scroll memes. And I remember there was this one. Uh, it was so fucking cringy that I, out loud, alone in my house, went, God fucking cringy. <laughs> and then I was like, if I have to see this, Ben has to see this. So I sent it to you. And you're like, and you text me back, you're like, dude, what the fuck? There was, was there was one yesterday. Oh, it was the Starbucks one. Oh no, I didn't text you. I called oh, you. Yeah, you called I called me. you on Instagram and I said, "I'm gonna kill myself." Yeah, it was just so horrible to watch. They're not like they're not bad. They're just like so cringe inducing. That I can try to find it real quick. I have it pulled up right here. The Starbucks one. Yes. Play it. Play it into the mic. This is the, this is the final audio from this this episode. And then I'm just going to hit stop afterwards. Hang on, let me turn on my right here. Got Starbies. I got Starbies. I don't even like coffee, but I guess I'll try it. Yeah. Delicious. Now let's see what goodies await me in here. Ooh, a cake globe. Wait, cake pop. It appears to be a perfect sphere. Nice. It kind of looks like a turd. First bite. Delicious. Yep, this is Nums. Activate Happy Dance. I got 